Hey guys, so we are joined by Mike and Yuvi of the Future Thinkers podcast. And it's probably overdue, to be honest, that we connect because we're in very similar areas. We speak to a lot of the same people. I'm really interested to hear from you guys what you've learned from those conversations and how that's influenced what you're doing. Because I know that there's probably quite similar journeys. And yeah, I'm really intrigued to hear how that's been. And maybe if you could just start by introducing yourselves and how you feel that your the Future Thinkers podcast has evolved over the last few years since you started doing it. Sure. Uh, and likewise, it's uh, we've been very intrigued by what you guys are doing. And it's been actually really nice and refreshing to see you putting out this content. I think there's a huge necessity for it. So, yeah, I, I honestly think that the, the more of this these conversations are out there, the better, because they need to be happening. So um, as far as Future Thinkers goes, we started in 2013, in the end of 2013, we recorded our first episode. And uh, it started because Mike and I were just having interesting conversations with each other every morning over coffee. And we had a bunch of friends who had podcasts. They were mostly business podcasts. But um, we thought, why not start our own podcast? But that wasn't about business. It was just about us, you know, talking philosophy with each other. Navel gazing <laughs> philosophy. Yeah, and we'd actually um, kind of started off doing this digital nomad thing. We read that book, The 4-Hour Workweek, and kind of used that as a roadmap for running a business, traveling. And we, we left, bought one-way tickets to Thailand in 2013. And then, you know, we'd... So it's all Tim Ferriss's fault. It is, yes. really. Um, but we were interested in a lot of the subjects, you know, the philo philosophical, psychedelic kind of, you know, those weird navel gazy subjects. So we ended up um, having a lot of those conversations when we had kind of bought our time back through being digital nomads. So read a lot more books, had a lot more of those conversations, then decided to start recording them. Mm -hmm. Did you guys, do you guys have like a background in philosophy or anything you study at university? What, what brought you to that specifically? We both had actually quite a series of really challenging events happening kind of in our late teens, early 20s. Um, a lot of deaths um, around us, a lot of just really challenging things. And I, for me, I'll speak about myself. Um, it kind of got me into meditation and, and I started to, you know, realize the fragility of life and got into a lot more philosophical subjects. Because a lot of the stuff I had been doing at that time was a lot more related to just music and music production. I was trying to be a recording engineer. And um, so I, I just felt like I wanted to have some kind of bigger impact than just recording metal bands in, in a basement studio. And I wanted to travel and see the world and that kind of stuff. So um, that really started the, um, the adventure. For me, um, I grew up in during the collapse of the Soviet Union. So I think just seeing the grit of the world and the problems of the world just shoved right in my face from an early childhood made me question a lot of things, made me question reality, question why, you know, people on TV were saying one thing, but I was seeing another thing in my everyday life. And uh, so I just, I spent a lot of time alone. I was kind of a loner as a kid and just spent a lot of time thinking about nature of reality. Uh, I didn't develop a, a formal meditation practice until later, but um, that was also a big part of my path. Um, I studied psychology in university and uh, also trying to understand human nature and uh, had, you know, had a lot of challenges, um, the same as, as what Mike was saying. And so I think it was just a natural progression for both of us that we came to these subjects. Great. So you both have a, a background in kind of inner growth work of some kind, meditation and, and philosophy. So what, what topics do you tend to cover on the show? Uh, well, it's actually kind of blending of, of our two interests. Like I'm a lot more techie, um, you know, studied programming, engineering, that kind of stuff. So I really like that stuff. I was really interested in artificial intelligence and blockchain, a lot of these technologies. Um, we haven't really been covering that stuff lately. It's been more about personal development, psychology, uh, sociology. Um, we're really interested in the development of society. And um, so we've been attracted to thinkers like, you know, Jordan Peterson, Jordan Greenhall, Daniel Schmachtenberger, these guys who are trying to map out the territory of, of the necessity of evolving society. And so that's what our podcast is about, the evolution of technology, society, and consciousness. Yeah, yeah, I'd love to come back to that in a minute about, 
I think probably we, we've, all of us have a sense of that there's a kind of direction to this conversation and that we're following the thread of the conversation and where it's going. The, the kind of emergence of Jordan Peterson was a real kind of exclamation point in that. And then, and we've also, I've got a sense we've also kind of honed in on some of the similar thinkers who we think have the really crucial pieces to add to that conversation. You mentioned Jordan Greenhall or Jordan Hall as, as he now is. Uh, Daniel Schmachtenberger, for example, Jamie Wheel, those kind of um, thinkers who are probably not as well known yet as the sort of intellectual dark web thinkers, but we, we, we all think have something really crucial to add to the, the conversation. Um, so we'll just before we get into that, um, we'll talk a little bit about our background. So Ali and I actually met through the Psychedelic Festival Breaking Convention, which is the biggest festival around psychedelic science in in the uk in europe as well it's in europe yeah at least that's what we say yeah i so, know it is the biggest in europe i think yeah yeah and so we've had a, a shared interest in psychology psychedelics personal growth and transformation and personally i i trained as a journalist i've worked for about probably 12 to 15 years as a journalist at the BBC and then at Channel 4 and then started making documentaries for the BBC and Channel 4. So working inside a newsroom as well for, there's a lot of people who work, uh, make documentaries, but I think that experience of being inside a newsroom and being like immersed in the, in the conversation for over 10 years is something that, that is, is quite a unique, obviously it's not unique, lots of other people do it, but but it gives you a, a different sense of kind of the ebb and flow of the of the the news agenda and just getting very frustrated and very bored with the whole thing like how facile so much of the conversation is and how difficult it is to break out of certain ways of looking at the world and how much is excluded from those the everyday perspectives and and what i what I really am hoping for from the, the video side of Rebel Wisdom is that we're bringing a slightly deeper lens on some of those questions. And I'm also in, interested to see where that goes in the future. What, are, what would a education policy or a health, a health policy influenced by a much deeper sense of who we are as people rather than this sort of materialist paradigm or this very... Um, transactional game a if people know that kind of terminology the the terminology that that uh brett weinstein jordan greenhall often often use um and that's something that i think is really interesting that's what i sort of see going forward as the interesting area to look at if we're talking about systems change or the end of one paradigm what does this new paradigm look like uh, and then just to sort of round that off that has to go into the transformational, that has to go into the liminal, that has to go into the, the, the areas of what you might call spirituality or personal growth. Or, and, and there's also not really a good language for it because all of those words are contaminated to one degree or another. So it's like, how do you have the conversation while all the terminology that you might use to talk about it has associations that, you, that, that kind of block so many people from hearing what you have to say? Um, so yeah, that's why Rebel Wisdom, with Rebel Wisdom we run events, we run live, uh, we run live events and then transformational workshops to try and bring all of those pieces together. Yeah, my background is um, maybe not so different to yours, Mike, in the sense that I started meditating quite early on in my life. So I think I was maybe uh, 18, 19 and I was really, I guess there's been two threads my own personal development uh, was one was psychedelics, which is the reason I actually started meditating is because I was fascinated by that experience and fascinated by really what um, what what it opened up. And so got quite into meditation and then was fascinated by just the whole philosophy around the psychedelic world. So I, I used to spend lots and lots of times in forums arguing about free will versus determinism and uh, any any kind of subject and that really felt like the cutting edge of the conversation to me uh, maybe 10-15 years ago yeah. 
uh, even to this day, I have a feeling that um, a lot of what was coming out of the psychedelic community 20, from you know, 20 years ago onwards was still very relevant and maybe quite far ahead of its time. I see a lot of the same ideas popping up. So I got involved in, uh, well, I started with my wife, a meditation school in London, and also uh, I'm one of the organizers of Breaking Convention, this psychedelic conference that David mentioned earlier, uh, which is happening now again in August. So it's been really interesting to watch that strand grow. I think over the years, I, I kind of took a step back from the psychedelic world because I, I feel any community gets very insular and uh, gets into a bubble and I didn't feel like all of the interesting conversations were happening there. Uh, then, as well as all of that, I was also working, kind of leading a double life. It was a very strange period where I was running a meditation studio and also freelancing and working in uh, advertising agencies and marketing agencies and having a foot very much in both worlds, in the world where you have to explain things very simply to people and the world of um, inner development where it's sometimes impossible to explain things at all. So I've always found that intersection and that crux point really fascinating to, I think Douglas Adams said, to F the ineffable. Now how do you, how do you translate what really is liminal and can't be felt in a way that is useful for people and that people understand? And so that's, that's always been a fascination of mine. And um, yeah, and, and the inner growth work, which it sounds like all of us share, has become increasingly important, uh, not just um, meditation, but also group work and practices like, for example, breath work or a lot of the embodied practices have become another piece of the puzzle. So it, it feels like, much like covering this conversation, there's always pieces of the puzzle that slot in and then there's a, there's a kind of growing, emerging process, both on the individual level and, and the collective level as well. Yeah, what's fascinating to me is the layering of all of these different um, kind of disciplines. And I, I definitely reference uh, spiral dynamics quite a bit because there are so many ways and developmental levels to look at the world and they become your lens, whatever kind of level you're operating from. And you could look th through shamanism, Buddhism, uh, the IDW, all different ways of kind of understanding the world. But I, I'm really interested in the connection points between all of them, the similarities and overlap. It's been really interesting bringing Integral into the conversation with the, the IDW because obviously we have um, interviewed quite a few of the IDW figures and then talked about the IDW as an emergent Integral conversation in a piece that Ken Wilber read and then got in touch to say, I'd, I'd love to, to, to speak to you about this. And then we did the interviews with him. And that, I think, Jamie Wheel put it well um, that... A lot of people who are currently breaking trail are running an integral OS. It's a very good operating system. I think the danger with it is that it's easy to get caught in that. If you get caught in that operating system, then suddenly you're only communicating with other people who are inside that system and you get lost in the map, which ironically integral talks about how you must never get lost in the map and then promptly often gets lost in the map. But there is this, there is a sense for me, certainly, that the, this IDW constellation really needs that map. Like Peterson, obviously, he talks a lot about Jean Piaget, and Jean Piaget was one of the originators of a whole of a developmental model. But I, I really think I just look at some of the conversations that are being had. For example, the Sam Harris Jordan Peterson debates about the nature of truth and the nature of religious truth and it's like oh they're, they're in different quadrants just talking past each other and a little bit of integral theory would have really helped them navigate that conversation and you wouldn't have had this sense of them just talking past each other infuriatingly for hours on end yeah this is so true i think it's really interesting how there's something is emerging right now where people are starting to understand that a single point of view is insufficient to view the world and we need some sort of a collective consciousness or a way to, for multiple people to contribute pieces to create a more whole picture of what is going on. 
And I think that the intellectual dark web has kind of started on that path where they're trying to integrate different points of view, but then they stalled a little bit because maybe people got too famous or, you know, they're getting a lot of reinforcement for this kind of more polarized or political stuff. And they a little bit got away from the sense making conversation. And there are other thinkers that are now becoming more prominent who are picking up that trail. I think that's the crux. I think that's the crux of what's going on. And it's 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 something we've talked about a lot. And I've been wrestling with a documentary for quite a while, Glitch in the Matrix 3, which is about exactly this. Um, I think the issue is partly that people in the IDW, some of them were very attached to certain perspectives. If you've built a career on a certain perspective, it's very hard then to unpick that and say, there was this, there was a sense at the beginning, especially the way it was originally framed as, if you've got a better idea, I'm happy to change my mind. This can be an evolving conversation. And I think it's fair to say that that's not really been borne out. I don't, I don't have a sense of real novelty coming from that constellation for quite a while now. Yeah, I think it's, for me it's interesting to compare the, the IDW to the thinkers we, we kind of touched on earlier. We've, we've all had in the channels, uh, you know, Daniel Schmachtenberger, Jordan Hall, John Verveke, who have an attitudinal difference than many of the IDW um, uh, figures do now at least. You know, maybe it wasn't true at the beginning. But the idea of being okay with not knowing, the idea of the liminal, all of that is, is so simple and yet so hugely important for the way the conversation moves. And, and so much of it also maps on to uh, what we know from the meditative, the, the contemplative traditions, you know, knowing how not to become attached, knowing the dynamics and the phenomenology of attachment. All of these things from the upper left quadrant, let's say from the inner world, are very important to translate into the way we communicate with each other. And it's, it's complex, but I think hugely, hugely important. Yeah, I've been very curious of where the influences have come from, if we want to use Jordan Peterson as an example. Like, to me, it felt like at the beginning, my interpretation of him was that he was trying to be a demonstration of how to debate properly. And it seems now that when you look at the YouTube headlines, uh, anything to do with Jordan Peterson, it's generally um, Jordan Peterson destroys so-and-so, right? And um, so... And then there's the fame component with him as well, that he's kind of blasted in the stratosphere of fame. And so there's something about the controversy that has pushed him that high that is now maybe causing him to perpetuate some sort of controversy. Like there's there's generally nothing kind of um, easy about what he says. It's very like finger pointy, kind of like you need to do this, you're doing this wrong, that kind of thing. So it's very hard for me to um, separate him from this movement in the way that this this movement seems to be co-opted by this sort of clickbaity kind of headline grabbing attention grabbing oppositional exactly so when we spoke to john viveki he said that he thought it was a mistake to to go down to the political level so he's talking about the meaning crisis and how jordan peterson's success is directly related to the meaning crisis but he he personally would was much less comfortable with making political statements and bringing it down into political realm. But at the same time, Jordan Peterson has a lot of his success and a lot of his fame has been that he's willing to have those conversations. And he's also, when he's good at it, he's very good at it. The, the Kathy Newman interview, for example, I think was a real case in point. It was, he kept his cool, he seemed very... Um, it, it really showed up a sort of um, a kind of simulated thinking in the media really, really well because it was like she was running a program and it was like, but there was an opportunity for a dialogue and that I thought could have been had. And I'd love to have seen him and Kathy, for example, have another conversation. I was actually, because I worked with Kathy and I also had done the documentary about Jordan, I was trying behind the scenes to get them to be able to talk to each other, but it was already, there was a lack of trust there and Channel 4 News didn't want to go there, Kathy Newman didn't want to go there, Jordan did. Um, and I see so many of the, and then I, I have a sense since then that he is, and he's actually talked about this himself in one of his um, Q and A's, that he's felt a little bit of battle weariness and um, defensiveness coming up 
And I think that's probably true with a lot of the other people in the IDW, the Sam Harris as well. And Eric Weinstein's also said that so many of the critiques were low quality that they've started to actually become immune and, and deaf to some of the better critiques. And I think that, that must be, it must be almost impossible if you're at that level of fame and you're getting so much critique and so much of it is actually poor to then be able to differentiate, okay, what's the good stuff from the bad stuff? Yeah. I'm, I'm really curious of your guys' perspective on the kind of shift in conversation in the IDW. And namely, I think I heard this term from you guys first, the intellectual deep web. Why is there a necessity to switch or what, what's with the new label? I don't really understand it. Ali came up for, with it, so. What's with it? Yeah, it's, um, well, I think the, the initial impulse was a lot of what we're talking about now is that, okay, well, there's a couple of things. Firstly, I don't think the conversation that needs to be had and the movement that we need to make as individuals or collectively is going to be solved from the intellectual level alone. I think the intellectual level is very important, but if something gets stuck in the intellectual, it just goes round and round. And you need something, I mean, we know this even from research into creativity. Um, you know, and Ian McGilchrist, who we've had on the channel a few times, has got a great take on this with the left brain and the right brain as well. The, the right hemisphere being largely responsible for what we don't know. And if we're, if we're not tapping into that, and we, we can get just kind of shut down into uh, reality tunnels. So the intellectual, I mean, to be fair, the word intellectual should be out of the entire equation, I think, rather than just intellectual deep web. It's just a little bit more punchy. But that, that there needs to be, again, an, in, an integral view on it. There's the intellect, and then there's something that goes beyond the intellect. And both of those need to be in the conversation. And rarely do I see that in the intellectual dark web, certainly not recently uh, at all, really. Uh, and that's the missing piece, I think, and that's the piece that uh, I think we're, we're always on the lookout for, and I think you guys too, is, is who's, holding, who's holding that perspective that can contain many perspectives and that can say, I don't know, and that can let go and flow. And, and also that there is, so I think it's also useful to think about who, who it would be in an intellectual deep web that wouldn't be in an intellectual dark web. Because I think, for me, the intellectual dark web it, it's, it's very, if, if it's got Jordan Peterson in, it certainly goes beyond the, the purely materialist. But there is still quite a kind of materialist bias to it, I think. Um, and I, I think that the other thinkers that need to be integrated into any sort of, if, if what we're moving towards is a genuine synthesis, then I think we need... People like Stan Groff, for example, who, who was doing some incredible depth psychology with psychedelics back in the 50s and 60s, came up with, with some kind of incredible models for personal transformation. You've got people like Richard Tarnas, who I think are some of the, an incredible thinker, pro, uh, produced something called uh, Passion of the Western Mind and then Cosmos and Psyche. Who are the people who are just a little bit too esoteric for... A, an, evolutionary, an evolutionary biologist like Brett Weinstein or a maths and physicist like uh, Eric, to, to, like who, who's a little bit too hot to handle for someone who's still concerned about their standing in the academy and, and who, ha, who is holding those extra pieces. I'd say it's also the kind of esoteric tradition of people like Rudolf Steiner. It's Carl Jung who, thanks to Peterson, is now becoming part of the conversation again. But but even he was warned not to go anywhere near Carl Jung while he was at, when he was at uni. It was like, this is, this is intellectually toxic to go anywhere near him. Freud just about, but no, Jung is, is too far away, um, is too, too esoteric. Now, thankfully, Jung seems to be coming back in a really big way, and I think he's an absolutely crucial thinker. But then you've got Stan Groff, who goes even further than Jung in, in many ways. So it's like, who, who are those people? Because I think there are, if you look at history as a kind of a river and a set of eddies, who are the people in the eddies to the side of that main intellectual current that are holding really, really important pieces? And I think some of those names that I've given are some of them, and I'm sure we can come up with more if, if we wanted to. And that, for me, is the depth, the depth piece. Mm. 
And also that there's something about dark light. There's, there's an implicit, there's an implicit binary in the intellectual dark web that I think isn't so much there with the deep web. There's, there's not really a binary with depth and shallowness in the same way as there is with dark and light. Mm. So I think we need to get out of the, the, the binary. We need to get out of the sort of um, polarization and, the, and, the, and depth may be the way to get out of it. I'm, I'm, I have a question for you guys actually on this note. Uh, a lot of the thinkers that we talk about or speak to are thinkers. You know, they, their medium, let's say, is ideas and communicating those ideas usually with language. Uh, there's, I'm very, I'm, I'm often wondering where are the artists and the storytellers and the really, you know, maybe, it, maybe there's a sculptor who's going to have some incredible explanation of the meaning crisis, for example. Have you guys ever thought about um, these people, these figures? Have you had any, who have you had on who you would class as kind of maybe a little bit more out there? Uh, I would, one of my favorite bands is Tool. I would love to have Maynard discuss these subjects. He's written so much about Carl Jung in the past, um, transcendence, DMT experiences. Um, he's a brilliant thinker. He's boring as hell to interview, but. Yeah, uh, I, th I think that you're really onto something. And actually, as you were talking about this, I was uh, thinking that it, it's exactly that what you said. It's not thinkers, it's more the practitioners who are going to become important. And we've noticed this pattern actually in our courses that people want to gain some sort of information, some sort of knowledge or framework, but they don't actually want to apply it. And this is a big problem with a lot of people who hang out in kind of intellectual, uh, in the intellectual space, that they're uncomfortable leaving it. And the kinds of people that I think we desperately need in this new conversation are the people who are comfortable in, or at least have experienced, the no mind, no self, liminal space. Yeah, it's a problem with this space that a lot of these ideas, actually, they can only be described through language, but you're describing like, how do you describe a DMT trip in language? It's just like, it, it fails. We tried, we did a whole series on DMT, UV and I took turns, and then we would document the experience. And both of us would just come out of the trip laughing because it's impossible to describe it. It's like, you know, I was like, okay, I know I've got to describe this now, and then all I could do is laugh. At least you've got a story for when you go on Joe Rogan's podcast and he asks you the inevitable question. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, he does a brilliant job of explaining it. I don't know how he puts words to it. But Practice. Yeah. <laughs> on both, Practice. both That's sides. Right. That's right. Um, I think there's a huge vacuum, um, a, a, a need for artists to come into this conversation, and I just don't see it being filled at all. Like... I would love to see more graffiti and more music and, and all kinds of different digital art being done. And that's something I think we've tried to do with our podcast. Like I create a lot of the artwork for the, pre, for the podcast before we switched to video. And it was just uh, an attempt to visualize the subjects, right? But I don't know. I don't know why there's not more out there that's kind of more popular than it is. Well, I think it's that, that uh, point that some people are just good at practice, but they're not good at putting it into words and vice versa. And even in saying that, I see a huge need for bridging. It's like we need better integration. Again, in integral terms, we need to integrate all the different faculties of the human experience that have become so separated for different cultural reasons. Yeah, so there's a, there's a band that I'm really into at the moment called Comet Is Coming. And I might even post the link to the review of their, uh, their latest album. And it's, the music is the same story. Like what they're saying through their music is exactly the same story as I'm hearing through the, 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 the guys on the cutting edge, the Daniel Schmachtenbergers, the Jamie Wheel. I think the review said something like dancing in a, it's like, it's like hopeful, hopefully apocalyptic music in some sense. That what they're, and, and what I hear in the music and why I'm so, so enthused by it is this sort of aliveness of possibility with this sort of still sense of the overwhelm of the, of the, the moment at the same time. Mm -hmm. And so I do think there are, there are people communicating very similar things in different mediums but possibly, and I'd love to talk to the, the, the saxophonist about it, and I, I, I strongly suspect that, that he would be trying to communicate through his music exactly the same experiences, 
probably through a lot of the same substances as some of the some of the, the guys that we're thinking about have um, have also uh, experienced. And so it, it, it is a case of bridging those, building those bridges, as you said, UV. How do you build those bridges? What is the soundtrack to the kind of conversations that we're having? Actually, I just got reminded, there's this short film that we really liked recently by Lubomir Ar Arsov, yep. is that his last name? Yep. Uh, called In Shadow. And it's, uh, it, it's, it has a very trippy music soundtrack and it's just visuals. It's a very beautiful kind of uh, dystopian demonstration of the, um, the fakeness of current uh, civilization. And then at the end, this hopeful twist that is very, uh, <laughs> I don't even know how to describe it. it it's esoteric. So like it's like kind sarcastically of optimistic somehow. I didn't find it to be sarcastic. I found it to be very uh, kind of mm, mystical union of the feminine and the masculine, and they ascend, and it's, it's very super archetypal. So I, I thought that was really cool. It's interesting. The, we, we had Eric Davis here yesterday. Do you guys know Eric Davis, the, yeah. the author? Yeah, he, he kind of, he's written a few books. Like he wrote one called Technosis, which is uh, the intersection between technology, psychedelics, the esoteric, a really interesting guy. But he had this phrase that stuck with me. He talked about li we're living in a banal apocalypse. <laughs> and I'm just kind of, it just popped up as, as everyone's talking because that is a common theme in the art that you're just describing is there is a sense of there's a sense of banality and a sense of apocalyptic uh, an apocalyptic situation and I'm still trying to feel into that the same question you had Mike a while ago is like why aren't there lots of artists putting out stuff because in every other historical period I can think of it was the the push against the culture or the thing that helped a new thing emerge was driven by the artists. And interestingly, now it seems not to be driven by the artists. And in fact, they seem to be absent. Not that they're not there at all, but it's it's kind of hard to find them. You know, we're, we're talking right now. We're trying to figure out, that, oh, there's this, you know, a few things are tapping into it. So I don't know whether that means we're headed for an explosion of a new era of art or something else is going on. I hope so. Um, I mean, one of the, our favorite subjects to talk about is um, basic income, which is, and the reason before I get into that, that I love that subject so much is that I love art and I, I love seeing art without the commercial means. And I think a lot of corporations are really good at co-opting art. The second you put something really mind-blowing creative out there, someone wants to hire you to make their explainer video, you know, so... Lubomir is, a good, I think, a good example of this. I don't know what he's doing now, but he made this brilliant art piece and we wanted to work with him and he's just booked up forever. There's no way to get him. So, um, yeah, I think something like a basic income, even a, a small amount just to get expenses covered would be really interesting to see uh, the effects on the art explosion that would happen after that. You know, how, how many times do you ask people what they would do um, you probably ask this question at the retreats all the time. What What would you do if you could do anything you want? If money was not an object. If, exactly. And how how many answers do you get back that it's like art or music or something like that? It's like most of the time that's what it is. I'd make documentaries, that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. So I would love to see what would happen with the basic income as, as far as the art explosion goes. Take away the commercial incentive. Yeah. I wanted to just raise something else, just thinking about that bridge building um, that I was thinking maybe we talk about after the, the call, but let, let's talk about it now and maybe it's something to be put out there as, as a kind of open inquiry. How do we turn this conversation that we're all aware of as a kind of emergent phenomenon and we, we're all, I'm sure you're contacted by people in the same way that we are, like constantly saying, how can I get involved in this? I really recognise what it is that you guys are doing. I've been following the same kind of threads. How do we... How do we turn this into a cultural movement? How do, we, how do we make it into more than the sum of its parts in a way that, I mean, I don't know what that is. I don't know whether it's a, um, it starts with a kind of dialogue in a, an email thread or a, or a Facebook group somewhere or something. And, um, and we think about who are the other people who are part of this kind of emergent phenomenon and and try and pull our resources. I, I don't know what it what it is, but I do get the sense of that we, I mean, I certainly feel it myself very keenly with rebel wisdom. It's like if we're not a catalyst for something bigger than ourselves, then what are we doing this for? 
because we don't have time. Even even if we were able to build a really kind of, and we're barely sustainable sort of financially as it is, but if we were able to create a sort of sus financially sustainable business and we're doing really well, I don't think that's enough. Mm. I don't think that's enough for what needs to happen in the near future. And I think it has to be some form of catalyzing something bigger than ourselves in that way. And, and in this game B world that we talk about as well, that it, it's about, it's a transegoic space. What does it look like to operate in this transegoic space? Who are the other people that are operating in it as well? And I mean really operating it, not just saying that they are. And then when it comes to any kind of crunch decisions, they go back to their kind of egoic programming. How do you get beyond this? And how, how, do, we, how do we scale or create more than, how do we create a movement around it? That's my question. That's my open inquiry. I think I have three kind of answers to that. The first is what we've attempted to do with our courses, which is about kind of about the isolation that people, you know, who are writing those emails are asking. They, they want a community to plug into, um, but there's a lot of work that needs to be done just on your own. Um, there's a lot of meditation. There's a lot of exploration. There's a lot of deconstruction of ego and identity that I think is necessary to establish what I would probably term a collective intelligence, like a global collective intelligence. There's a lot of ways that a collective intelligence can screw up if someone, you know, is signaling how smart they are or, you know, wants to be the center of attention or is just kind of operating out of ego. So there's there's that initial thing that people need to do before they should even attempt anything else. Do that in that self construction and deconstruction work. I think that's what Peterson talks about quite a lot. Um, then there's the community aspect which is parallel which i think you guys are trying to do as well as us so i think that means that we need to have people who are kind of training the trainers to go out there start their own thing could be a podcast could be a documentary could be art of any kind we've talked about a lot of that stuff but just start their own community where they are so plug into online communities like what we're doing and then start your own thing as well so those are the three things I would say that practice is a huge part of it because it's not just that people need to be having conversations. And I think that was one of the maybe failings of the integral movement is that it just became very intellectual. You know, people are just, we're, yeah, we're also integral and we're having these integral conversations, but no change is actually happening. So change comes through practice and, you know, accessing that liminal space where your previous sense of self, your previous sense of the world can dissolve so that something new can emerge. And I think that giving people maybe a set of practices, uh, but something that they can do on their own without supervision, without guidance, and a way to self-organize is going to be really useful. Something simple and repli replicable. Yeah, I agree with that. I think there's also a big missing piece and one of the big reasons that it's so difficult to get us all to go kind of post-egoic and stay there and be anti-fragile in that and not, not crumble when, when the stakes get higher is that we need something, some higher order purpose which is higher than the ego that everyone is aimed towards. And we used to have that. And I, I feel often in the conversation, the high level conversation, there's a lot of euphemisms for God or for the divine, or for the mystery, or whatever it is. And I don't think it needs necessarily to be named, but I think, you know, Jung talked about this as well, just in terms of the ego and the self. If the ego doesn't have the self to sit within, and the ego thinks it's above the self, then you get the narcissism, then you get the confusion. You need something that contextualizes the ego, but I guess the complicated thing is, how do we find that thing or what is that thing how do you even point people towards that thing in a way they agree to you know because that i think is very important there needs to be some sense of we are all working towards some higher purpose or to some higher and i'm not sure what that higher purpose should be framed at but it feels like a very important piece that's missing because that brings humility and it also brings shared uh focus and intention mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I struggle with that one, actually, def to define that for myself, because, I mean, I have worked really hard to to remove desire and remove ego from as much as I can in my day to day life. I'm not saying that's 
that's mission accomplished. But, and I, I think to a degree, what we're doing with future thinkers, I have done it in, in a way that cleans the purpose of it. Like we are, I want to have fun doing what I'm doing and I want to affect people. But beyond that, the day to day, if it's not fun, it's not going to be achieved. I'm not going to do it anymore. I'm not going to work on it. If, if it affects people, then that's just a, a byproduct. And I think the fact that that's my, one of my first priorities cleans the purpose of it, where it's like, I'm not attached to some result. I don't need your money. I don't need your approval. I don't need your, you know, respect. I just want to have fun and share what I'm passionate about some of these subjects that we're talking about. I think that's kind of the same. You're more purpose driven than I am, but, yeah. but, um, I, I think removing the desire to be something or signal something or achieve something has really cleaned the whole thing for me. So I'm not chasing after money. I'm not chasing after approval, anything like that. Like I used to. But I think what Alex was saying is that, uh, there needs to be something greater for it to fall back on because not everybody can uh, just exist in that void, in that empty space. Like that's, it's a much more difficult, you know, it's like a few steps down. But what so I... something greater than yourself to rest on is a lot more achievable for the majority of people, whether that's God or nature or the mystery or the universe, the divine, whatever they call it. But if people disagree on what that is, then it can cause problems and bickering. I think it also allows for for those those kind of we talked about branches as a as a metaphor yesterday, like swinging from branch to branch like a monkey. It's like you go from one ideology and then that ideology collapses and you have to grab onto something else. And what I'm attempting to do is just to let go altogether and see what happens. And I think that's a big part of the problem in this conversation is people are operating from their different ideologies and trying to like co-opt other people and um or convert and i just think a lot of that needs to stop and for us to just you know kind of go both end like accept all the positions and not really hold tightly to any position and that's been if i if i hadn't have let go completely i think i probably will or i probably would have still been pursuing money and that that message and goal of future thinkers would have been bastardized in some way. Mm. But there must be, like, there must be. Some, well, I'm not. I say must be. I'm wondering: is there, the, in letting go psychologically, is very difficult to do unless you feel you're going to be caught. Unless you feel that, say, the universe is a fundamentally supportive place that it's safe to let go into. And I'm wondering if, if that is how you see things, because I I think that's partly what I mean by a sense of kind of coherence and cohesion in reality that people agree on as well is, is quite important. But, um, and that was traditionally the role that religion would give people, for example. They, they would know that there is a higher order purpose, there is, a, there is a reason to things, and that creates a different kind of interaction. Now, we're well past, you know, we're in, in post-modernity, so it's very difficult to just go back to that. So I, I guess that that's my inquiry is, what does it look like now? How, how, you know, in a decentralized collective intelligence, what does that shared thing like? I think Verveke talks about this in, in probably the most detail and says it in the best way. I, I think we are in a meaning crisis and a lot of times in the past that meaning has been given from religion of some kind, but it's also been provided by tribes and community. And I think we lack both of those things generally, and which is why people are, are just so desperate. You know, if you kind of let go of the branches, uh, I think the tribe is meant to be there to support you through that. And we don't really have that. So that fall is potentially dangerous, but I, I think that's, that should be the goal, like establish a community, establish a tribe, and then try and let go. The problem that I have with that is that people tend to form meme tribes. They form tribes around ideology because they desperately need a tribe. So uh, to, to go back to the question of, is there some shared higher purpose? Well, because we are experiencing very serious existential risks on this planet, especially climate change, which is becoming very uh, accelerated and very evident. I think that 
for the time being, that shared purpose or that something greater than ourselves could be earth, nature. And I think that's something that a lot of people can connect with quite easily. And it's not very esoteric either. Mm, interesting. Yeah. Hmm. What do you guys think? I can answer it for myself. I, I don't know if I can answer it in the general. Mm. Um, I know what it is that makes my life purposeful. I know what my particular skill set is. And I know what that... What... I have a sense of what... There's this kind of sense of a, of a... There's the Buddhist idea of awakening, but I think there's a kind of deeper awakening, which is where you awaken... And in some sense, that means the universe is way more intelligent than, than is almost conceivable, that you realise you, you kind of awaken into a place where you have exactly the right skills and the right... You, you, you awaken in exactly the right place. That we're all sort of, and that's kind of what we're all trying to express in some in some sense, like this. And we all have to find that for ourselves, and we have to find that kind of awakening into the place where we're meant to be, with exactly the right history and having achieved all of, given ourselves exactly the right skills to do what we need to do next. And that's something that we all have to come to ourselves. It's very difficult to generalize, and. Because when you start looking for this grand explanation, what you end up doing is coming right back down to the level of the individual and right back down to the very, um, almost the microscopic. I mean, the, the kind of clean your room is not a ridiculous place to start. But the missing piece in that that I think a lot of people react against in, in Jordan Peterson is that he doesn't make the next step. Like, clean your room, sort yourself out first, and then you'll know what to do next. And then there's the, the, when you break it down like that, it almost sounds like magical thinking. And, it, and when, you expa when you explain it in that way, it does sound like magical thinking. It's like, what, what do you mean? How, how can that be? When you look at the, the ice caps melting and the biodiversity loss and all, all of these require structures to deal with, it's like all I can do is say is trust that all of the people who have caught, been called into making that particular area of because I'm not, I'm not a climate scientist. I don't, I don't know anywhere near enough about all of these things to say anything definitive. I sense that same level of existential threat. And I think that the, the crisis that that is a manifestation of is far deeper. And I'm interested in the sort of philosophical roots of that crisis. And that's what I think I'm personally speaking to in the interviews and um, documentaries that I'm making. And I know that I can do that. And that's what I think I'm meant to be doing. But all I can do is have faith that the people that are, that are involved in those conversations are having similar awakening moments to the ones that I'm having and I see the people around me having, that that will be the thing that um, gets, if not all of us, but at least as many of us as possible through what is to come. Does that speak to, the, to that question or not? Yeah, it does. Um, it, it inspired the next train of thought here for me, which is um, you, you mentioned Peterson saying just clean up your room and that kind of like, okay, what's the next step? I really feel that what the next step is there that and I f kind of feel the reason he's not saying it because there is no roadmap that can just be handed. You, you do have to just keep kind of climbing on your own. And for a lot of people, they're they're freaked out by the state of the world, but their you know their room isn't clean. They're and that that is a metaphor. Like their life isn't clean. They're, they're kind of grasping onto one thing or another and emotionally reacting to nearly everything. And there's something about that in the way our society converses and tries to make decisions collectively that is is causing a lot of problems. Like the reason we can't um, collectivize, solve some of these problems, you know, make policies that at least try and work towards reversing climate change. And that's just one example. Like we're, we're just not collectivizing and having productive conversations. And I think the IDW is attempting to show people how to have productive conversations again. So there's something about sovereignty, individual uh, um, mental sovereignty that is important here where 
I feel like if you if you're looking for meaning in these different things, like a meaning in it, as in I must contribute to the world, I must change the world, and it's like you haven't done that individual quiet work of cleaning your room, cleaning your life, then you're you're not going to be prepared to make the right steps in the world. You might be responding to some sort of internal lack or fear, and you're you're going to be taking actions that aren't necessarily going to be the right thing for the world. So. That's why I think it's kind of self-evident in what he's saying, what the next step will be. It's like there's so much work to be done individually. And then the path, every next step lays itself out for you as you go. And I think there's another thing that's quite interesting about the IDW or the intellectual deep web. And specifically to what Jordan Greenhall or, Green, or Jordan Hall and Daniel Schmachtenberger have been saying. And the, not necessarily what they're saying, but how they're saying it. It's like they've climbed this mountain, this intellectual mountain, and have surveyed the landscape, surveyed the mountain that they've just finished climbing. And there's a lot, the rest of us are still climbing. And we're trying to figure out how to get there. And I'm, I'm not saying there's a plateau and it's done. Like they're still climbing as well. But it's like they, they've turned around and are shouting instructions at us. But those instructions are not really helpful in, in the position that people are at generally. They don't necessarily need the survey of the landscape. They just need to be told, keep going, and this is climbable. climbable. You can do it. Like when you're climbing, you're just worried about the next step. Just keep going, the next footing. It's almost like they're describing the landscape that's up, a, up ahead, but you don't need to know that to get there. Mm. Most people don't. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I think... That's one of the reasons Peterson's been so successful is because he has surveyed the land and he's not really shouting back these detailed instructions at people. He's just saying, take the next step, clean your room, you know, do that next thing because people are so lost and they're basically stuck at their base camp and not moving. So he's just saying, start climbing again, start climbing. And I, and I also want to just throw something more in here just in case people are watching this and haven't seen much of Peterson's stuff because you can't break down... Like if you watch the Maps of Meaning lecture series, um, compared to his 12 Rules for Life, for example, which I, I have to admit I haven't finished reading, the, the Maps of Meaning lecture series is, a, is an absolute tour de force. It's an absolute masterpiece of a, a coherent in theory of everything, similar to Ken, Ken, Echoes of Ken Wilber for me in the kind of the breadth and the attempt at, at linking together all of these kind of mythologies and stories into a coherent framework. So it's not that it's not that all he's offering is sort of clean your room and do the, the, the things you can do. There is a there is a much broader vision that, that, that I don't think I don't think as many people as I would like are aware of. Um, but yeah I just wanted to sort of throw that in there. Just I, I give a little shout out to the Maps of Meaning series. <laughs> yeah it was awesome actually it's it's what got me into Jordan Peterson as well. Uh, I wanted to speak to the sovereignty piece, and I think that it's an extremely important process and practice coming into the world that we're living in now and for the future. So sovereignty, as in having an internal compass, having internal authority for where you're going, instead of looking for some external person, authority figure, system, map, to tell you what to do and where to go because the the ground is shifting beneath our feet even the authorities or so-called authorities don't know where they're going they're just doing their best and the people who seem to be making the most sense are in fact operating in that liminal space where the ground is constantly shif shifting underneath their feet and i think that that is maybe the most useful thing that people can do is find their own internal compass so that all they really need is for somebody to just encourage them and say, keep going and this is doable and nothing more. They have to figure out everything else by themselves. And I know that's extremely harsh and it doesn't land well with a lot of people that we try to tell this to, but I really deeply think that that's what's necessary right now. Mm -hmm. and, and yet, if you look at the hero's journey, that, that, is, the, that is every story. It's the, it's the space of going from dependency and uh, a lack of agency and lack of sovereignty to having to make the choices for yourself to decide who am I? What kind of person am I? And the hero or heroine makes those choices and then they are someone else at the end. 
Yeah. And exactly. continuing with that metaphor, there there is usually in the hero's journey that wise character that hands the tool, the sword, the map, the ring, whatever, to the hero that allows them to cross cross the threshold and achieve their goal. But it's never like a, a full map. Yeah. Mm. yeah. True. And that, true. Yeah, that, that's another sort of jumping off point. But I've heard it said many times, where are the elders? Mm. Mm. Yeah. I, our elders have not gone through what we've gone through. They, they were not born into the internet. They were not born in the transition of the internet. They're barely keeping on, you know, keeping up with what's going on. And, um, and things are moving so fast that they'll never keep up. So we're in need of new elders. Like we basically have to be the, this internet generation or the millennials. We have to kind of establish a system in our own ranks to kind of push people through wisdom to be the elders for the next generation. Cause we're, we're basically in that crossing the threshold state. There's just not, no one who's mapped this territory ahead of us. Barely. I mean, some people are, but they're, they're barely older than we are. Is there any, anything that you guys wanted to say before, before we wrap up? Maybe give a shout out to your course and the fact that you are doing some of the, you are providing some of these tools that we've talked about. Yeah, sure. Well, the, the courses um, can be divided into two parts. There's sovereignty, so how to get clarity in, in your uh, perception, your sense making, your agency. Um, there's a lot of stuff to do with deconstruction of the mind in that one. Uh, the second part is about shadow work, which is about facing your demons, facing the shadow in the Jungian sense, um, which I think is pretty much a necessity um, to be able to participate in the collective intelligence that, you know, a, a lot of us are trying to converse about in these types of conversations. And also to be able to contribute meaningfully to the world without acting out those unconscious traumas or issues. Yeah. Um, that you can find at uh, courses.futurethinkers.org and then our podcast just at futurethinkers.org. Yeah, and we're also planning some retreats um, that are going to be probably in Bulgaria or Portugal to start and then who knows where else uh, that put these things into practice and create the in-person community for people to be able to participate in this work. Great. And uh, you guys, I know, are doing these retreats. Yeah, I'm really, uh, I, I was hoping to talk about that a bit well come, come come on one and then um then you'll definitely have more to talk about yeah, <laughs> yeah we'll do a cultural exchange yeah yeah the men the men's work we we've been doing for quite a long time since we we set up our own men's group found it really useful and then expanded that out into firstly day-long workshops and then a, a whole weekend based on the hero's journey mm. that i I, I genuinely think it's about as powerful a two-day process as there is out there. Having done a lot of this kind of work for quite a while, um, it, it really it, it gives people an opportunity to a real opening to make changes in their lives, which is ultimately all, all we can do is create a kind of a space for people to make the changes because it's then up to them to, to, yeah. to put them into practice. But it's also in the, in the retreats, it's about empowering the guys to create their own men's group, to support each other afterwards, to, to use that space to, to catalyze, um, yeah, to empower them to support themselves, which is all we can do really, I think. Mm. Very cool. Yeah, we'll definitely come to those. Cool. Great. It's been a real pleasure. And yeah, yeah I look forward to the part two and seeing where this conversation leads next. Yeah. And I'm sure we'll be, uh, all, both of us will be kind of interviewing whoever the next people to surface in yeah. this evolving conversation, wherever they come from. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks, guys. It's been really enjoyable. Yeah, this has been great.